Now it's a common observation that neonates and young children have a disproportionately large head to their body. At birth the head is about 19% of body surface area. But by the time the child has reached 15 years of age, it goes down to 9% of body surface area. So there's a fairly big change in, in the proportion of the body surface area occupied by the head, and that's fairly common knowledge. But as well as that, there's changes in the shape of the head and the shape of the skull. So here we have an adult head. And we notice with the adult head, the occipital area, the occiput, is, is, is fairly horizontal. It doesn't stick out. There's a fairly slim line occiput there. And that's actually quite useful when we come to opening the airway in an adult. Because this is the position when the airway is closed if the patient has got a low level of consciousness. When the head is flexed. And all we need to do then of course is extend the head, providing we're happy there's no cervical spine injury. And we see that the airway opens up and the tongue is now pulled forward from the oropharynx and we now have an open airway so we can now look, listen and feel at the top to make sure the airway is open. So fairly straightforward in an adult really. But in neonates and in infants up to the age of about one year, the occipital area is much more prominent. We have a much more prominent occiput. So it's more this kind of shape like this. Now what this means is when the child is lying on a flat surface like that, the large occiput is essentially flexing the head forward. And we can see that now the child's head is flexed forward, even though they're lying fairly flat, because the head is flexed forward, is the airway open or closed now? But I think you can see that the airway is, is closed in this neonate or this few month old uh, child. So what we need to do, I suppose we could dig a hole in the table, but that would be inconvenient. So what we need to do is put something under the shoulders. And when we lift the shoulders, we can see that even although they have a large occiput, which is still there, of course, that the airway is now open because we've lifted the shoulders. We've lifted the shoulders up the way. And we want what we actually want in, a, in an infant, a neonate in an infant, up to the age of about a year, is a neutral alignment. So we don't want the head flexed and we don't want the head extended. And that allows us to count for the large occiput. Now let's look at why this is so important. Now what I have here, what I have here is two straws. This one's from a well-known fast food outlet. This is an ordinary drinking straw. Now this straw here is seven millimeters in diameter. And that is the equivalent diameter, internal diameter of a trachea when a child is seven years old. So it's relatively small. You can see that compared to my hands. It's a relatively small structure. But this straw, and I measured it carefully, this ordinary drinking straw is four millimeters of internal diameter. That's all it is. And that's the size of the child's trachea. And as well as that, the trachea in the neonate and in the infant has soft collagen. In fact, there's relatively soft collagen throughout the structures of the upper airway when the child is born. It doesn't have the rigidity of the older child. It doesn't have the rigidity of the adult. So in lungs, for example, when children are born, there's lots of type three and type four collagen, which is not very strong. But as they get older, more type one collagen, the, the, the firmer, tougher collagen is deposited. So if we think about this drinking straw, if the child's head is uh, extended, then we can see that we've kinked this oh so small airway. It's kinked. And if the child's head is flexed, then again, we've kinked the oh so small airway. So we need that neutral alignment to maintain the patency of the airway as much as we can. So remember that when you're positioning children, we want this neutral alignment to maintain the airway. And the head tilt probably starts to become more significant from the age of one year onwards. But of course, what we always must do is we have to titrate the position of the airway with, with our clinical skills. So we must always look at the child's chest and abdominal movements. 
we must listen for the air going in and out of the child's uh, nose and mouth and we must also feel it with our ears and that helps us to guide our positioning of the child's airway but that's a good rule of thumb this is what the resuscitation council teach that we want neutral alignment from birth to round about one year of age and start thinking about neck extension as we do in adults with older children and of course we're, we're, with adults we want the normal neck extension to keep the airway open so always keep the airway open that's your a So what I have here is a straw from a well-known fast food outlet and I've measured the diameter of this, the internal diameter, and it's seven millimetres and you can see how small it is compared to my fingers. So that's actually way bigger than the neonatal infant's airway, wider diameter. But this smaller straw here, I've measured this one and this is actually four millimetres. So it's this straw here, and we can see the size of that in comparison to my fingers. This is the actual internal diameter of the infant's airway. Now, what this means is, with it being so narrow, that if we flex the head, and can you see what's happened? Because it's so narrow and the head is flexed, we've got that kinking effect. Or if the head is extended, can you see what happens now when the head is extended? So what we need to do is bring the head into neutral alignment. Then we have the patency because we've only got four millimetres. So precious four millimetres. So we keep the head in neutral alignment to maximize the lumen, the internal lumen. Now, why do you think these airways are so narrow? Why is it, I mean, even the adult trachea in life is only, is only 12 millimeters. Why are they so narrow? Why do you think? Well, if they were wider, more infection will get in. But I think the key thing is to limit the amount of dead space. Because if the trachea was wider, then there would be much more dead space and much greater ventilate, ventilatory effort would be required to get sufficient oxygen to the respiratory areas of the lung. So here we see this in diagrammatic form. We've got the child lying on essentially a flat surface. And because the occiput is relatively large, that is essentially moving the head up in this direction. So the head is essentially being flexed. It is putting the chin more on the chest. And we see that in this position, the tongue has fallen back and it has occluded the oropharynx. But then in this diagram here, we've put something underneath the child's shoulders. And what this means is that while the large occiput is still resting on the flat surface, the child's shoulders have now been lifted. And that means that the shoulders have moved up that way, so the head has relatively moved down that way. So we've had this kind of movement here. And what this means is that the child has been brought back into neutral alignment. So in this position, the head was flexed forward like this. It was flexed forward. The neck in the child is already short, of course, so that was occluding the airway. But in this, because we've raised the shoulders, we've essentially allowed the head to fall back somewhat, restoring the neutral alignment. And as we see, that has opened the child's airway. So we now have this essential space at the back of the oropharynx for the air to get down into the anterior trachea.
Well, it's good to come out and sniff the morning air. Fill your lungs with the morning air. And what I did then was I put my head up to sniff the air. And that's why this is called the sniffing position. And it's extension of the neck. This is extension of the neck. On the converse of that, we'll be putting your chin down on your chest. That will be flexion of the neck. And it's important to know about because if I put my head down like that with my chin on my chest, if I flex my head, then I can still breathe. But the reason I can still breathe is because I'm conscious. And without realizing it, I'm automatically keeping my upper airways open with voluntary muscular activity, even though it's controlled largely autonomically. But if I was unconscious and my head was down like that, my airway would close off. But if I've got my head in the extension position like this, in the sniffing the morning air position, then my airway is held open by the anatomical position of my head and my neck. So while it's good to sniff the morning air, it's also good to know that if we come across an unconscious patient, we need to extend the head in order to open the airway while all the time we are monitoring that the patient is adequately ventilating their lungs.